where I believe um, Brother Jeff King is going. Brother Jeff King is up there. You come at this time. You will introduce yourself and your family. And God bless you. Oh, good evening. Good evening. I think I'm on. There you are. You are. It is good to be with you again. I believe we were back here and sometime in February. We were going to try to make it to the missions conference, and we had another one scheduled. I had to check my calendar, and we're we're excited, though, to hear that you had such a great missions conference. And uh, we were thinking about you all, as I told the uh, preacher uh, when I was talking with him before the service. And so we do appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I ask my family to stand. And to my left, to your right, is our oldest son, Isaac. He's 13. And then my daughter Abby is 10, and then my son on the end is uh, Zach, and he is 12, and then my wife Susanna, she's 18. <laughs> and I'm Troy, and I'm 65, so you don't know how you can look like this at 65 to me after service. No, not really. But it is good to be with you, and we are headed to the country of Belize, to the Toledo district. We'll be about four or so hours away from Brother Greg, and we dropped in on a Wednesday night. He happened to be here in the service, and so we just really hit it off, and we're now uh, friends via the internet, and it was a, an encouragement to me to see another missionary. I'm sure that we were an encouragement to him to see that there's other missionaries going to the same country. And so we've developed that friendship, and a friendship that once we get to Belize, that we'll be able to continue, we'll be able to see each other, iron sharpened the iron, and uh, that's very, very important. So we will be in this town of Punta Gorda. It's a fishing village in the Toledo district of about 6,000 people. And from that area, we'll live in Punta Gorda, and we will go west, northwest, to over 25 different Mayan villages there in southern Belize. We're primarily going to be working with the Mayan Indians there. And there is no independent Baptist missionary working with those uh, Indians at this time. And so we're praying that the Lord would raise up uh, others to come and work alongside with us, together with us, to team up. And uh, but we're excited about kind of the groundbreaking uh, work that we can be able to accomplish for the Lord down in Southern Belize. Two things that will, and uh, some of these things I'm telling you because the video does not, uh, two things that there will be struggles for us reaching the Mayan people. Number one is that because we're Americans, they want whatever we have. And therefore, Jesus is just like every other guy. Jesus is just like every other thing that any American would have. And so they'll take Jesus freely. And so we have to be very careful that they do not take something without truly being regenerated, without truly accepting Christ as a Savior. So we have to be very careful in presenting the gospel to them. And secondly, in presenting the gospel to them, they are illiterate. So you cannot hand them a gospel tract. You cannot leave it on a hut, on a door. Uh, you cannot leave it there. Now, we will use those things to be able to go down through and show them how they can know Christ is their personal Savior. But there's something that's even better than just using a track that we can actually get into their homes. And that is that there is a missionary up in Mexico that we've been in contact with that is working, actually he's in the process of almost finished, uh, putting together a CD that has a gospel presentation on it for the Mayan Indians. And so we'll be able to take those CDs and be able to duplicate them down in southern Belize to be able to give them to the Mayans because the country of Belize will give them CD players so they can have it for radio and other uh, means of listening to find out weather reports and hurricane information as it comes across. And so we're able to use that technology of just a CD, a simple CD, to be able to get the gospel in the, those villages and in those homes. And so that's very, very exciting, something that we're, we're going to be able to, to kind of groundbreak down there in southern Belize. And some of our future goals uh, while we are down there is, number one, we, of course, want to train nationals. After they get saved, we want to train them, and we want to plant a church there, and then over a process of time, be able to give it back over to that national pastor. And then, not just church planning, but we're also praying about starting a radio station down in southern Florida, uh, southern uh, Belize, uh, and uh, in southern Belize, uh, we can actually reach out to those illiterate people through radio. And since they have the radios already, we can reach them through radio, much like you do here at 90.5. So it is very, very exciting, and that's one of our first term, after our first term goals is for the radio station, but we'll primarily be church planning and really just open to whatever God would have us to do. We're not going to go down and say, 
you know, this is what we're going to do, bless God, and we're going to stick with it. We're open to whatever God reveals to us as we're there, the needs that we see. And if God says start an orphanage, then that's what we'll do. Uh, but once we get down there, the Lord will show us. I've heard stories of missionaries getting to the field, and they, they knew exactly what they were going to do, and they got down there, and God just kind of shook it all up, and they saw a different need. They saw an area where they hadn't planned on maybe serving, and so they started serving in those areas, and God just blessed. And so we're excited about getting there. At this point, we're almost very close to 35% support. We just finished, uh, we uh, just started full-time deputation in January, and uh, last year we were on part-time deputation as I was doing some seminary work trying to prepare for the mission field. In the last 12 years, I've taught in Christian school, Christian education at, at a Christian school there in Tennessee and up in Ohio, and the Lord called us from uh, teaching there in the school and working on the bus route and teaching Sunday school and every other thing that you can serve in. Uh, he called us from there to serve on the mission field. And uh, so we sit, we sat where you're sitting tonight and uh, just loving missionaries, loving missions. And uh, so we're really excited to be with you here tonight to be able to present what God's like on our hearts as a country of police. And we'll go ahead and show the video, and then after the video, we'll come up and present for you. Troy Lewis family, missionaries to the country of Belize. Let me introduce my family. I'm Troy, my wife Susanna, and our three beautiful children, Isaac, Zach, and Abby. Our sending church is Franklin Road Baptist Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Pastor Mike Norris. God has burdened us for the Mayan people of Belize. The Mayans are considered a forgotten people group. We will be concentrating on the southern portion of Belize where this people group is located. We believe in fulfilling the Great Commission through personal soul winning. This can be done by door-to-door -door visitation, bus routes, and track distribution. We are headed to Southern Belize to evangelize the unsaved, edify the believers, and establish local churches. It is our goal to proclaim, perfect, and plant the Word of God among the Belizean people. Acts 14, 21 through 23 says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Hi, again, I'm Susanna, and I'd just like to give you a brief testimony of what God has done in my life. I was a pastor's child for most of my childhood, and when I was a teenager, both my parents became Christian school teachers. I was saved at the age of five as a result of a missionary coming to my Sunday school class. Each child was given a track with the picture of Big Ben, the large flock in England, on the front, and the plan of salvation inside. When I got home, I wanted my mom to reread it to me. She did. She reread it, explained it, and was able to lead me to Christ in my home that day. I was later baptized by my father, who was also my preacher. As a teenager, I surrendered my life and my future to God at summer camp. Because I grew up in a pastor's home, I have always been involved in church. As a child, I enjoyed watching and often helping my parents joyfully serve and minister to others. Acts 20:24 20, says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I may finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. My parents' example, much like Paul's, has taught me to serve the Lord as an adult. I have always marveled at how God's hand has protected and guided me through my life. I am now excited to see how God's hand once again will lead as my family heads to Belize to tell the lost about our Savior's love. I'd like to take a few moments and share with you my testimony of how the Lord saved me. I did not grow up in a Christian home. 
My parents were moral people who trained us to be loyal, honest, and kind. We did not go to church or really even consider it. The only Bible in our house was the family Bible on the living room table that held pictures. As I became a teenager, God was still the farthest person from my mind. My friends would even invite me to church. I can remember one incident standing in my high school's parking lot late one Saturday night, and a friend invited me to go to church. I replied, why do I want to go to church? There is no God. The Bible says in Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I was certainly lost. After I graduated high school, I went to college near my hometown. During my freshman year of college, I was invited to go to church by several employees I was working with. I finally broke down and went. I attended for several months and on February 5th, 1995, I went forward on a Wednesday night and accepted Christ as my Savior. Soon afterwards, I was baptized. My father-in-law discipled me, and upon discipleship, I had decided I wanted to be a Christian school teacher. God has truly shown himself mighty in my family's life, and we count it a privilege to take that same power that transformed my life to the Mayan people of Belize. The country of Belize is considered third world. Belize City is known as having the highest crime rate in the Caribbean region. Belize has a mixture of false religions from Catholicism to Seventh-day Adventists. During our survey trip, God showed us the emptiness in the lives of the Belizeans that can only be filled by His love through salvation. We see such a strong hunger in the people for the truth, which is the only thing that can set them free. I'm Isaac. I want to tell you a little bit about the country of Belize. Belize is a country that borders the Caribbean Sea between Guatemala and Mexico and is the size of Massachusetts. Belize's population is 320,000 and received its independence in 1981 from Great Britain. I'm Zach. Did you know that Belize can be reached from the American mainland by air in two hours? Belize is made up of six different districts. They are Coruscant, Orange Walk, KO, Belize, Toledo, and Stan Creek. The Belizean people have religion, but they lack the truth. Only 2% of Belizeans that live off main roads have ever heard of Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Abby, and I'm so excited that Belize speaks English as their main language. Other languages include Creole and Spanish. Belize is made up of more than 10 different people groups. To pay for things in Belize, you can use the American dollar or the Belize dollar. The American dollar is worth twice as much as the Belize dollar. The country of Belize's economy is supported mostly through tourism, fishing, and fabrics. When you travel the countryside, it is evident that the Belizeans live very simply. Their main modes of travel are buses, bikes, and walking. We will buy most of our foods from roadside stands and open-air markets. Culturally, it is much different than North America. Even I am trying to figure out the laws of the land. There are no traffic lights, but every bank has an armed guard with a sawed-off shotgun. In the whole country of Belize, of nearly half a million people, there is only a small handful of churches that preach the gospel. Would you pray for us as we go tell the Belizeans of Christ and His power to save? Every kindred, tribe, and tongue, millions of people who never heard of God's dear Son. Some vow to worship idols that can never answer prayer. Some worship their own intellect and doubt that God is there. God has called His people. Things change. 
changed since he was here. Oh, who will send the That's where the gospel presentation, that's where the missionaries come in. 
And listen, it's not speaking here in the nation. It's not speaking of the 1040 window, where there, most of the population of the world is located in that 1040 window. And we have so few missionaries there. That's not what this is necessarily talking about. It's all nations. That's the United States included. That's Florida. That's Milton. That's the surrounding areas. This is talking about a global vision that everyone is supposed to praise His name. In Psalm 110. I'm sorry, Psalm 100. The Bible says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Again, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. How is that possible? How is it possible that all lands, all nations are supposed to praise God? That's where we have to get the gospel out so that they can. Yes, everyone can walk out and see and see the creation and know that there is a God. But many, that's where it stops. Because they don't have the word of God. They don't have a messenger to come and tell them. And so tonight, as we use these verses to springboard into Luke chapter number 10, the Bible says, After these things, the Lord appointed 70, other 70 also, and sent them two and two before His face into every city and place where they Himself would come. You know, we have to get this around our minds and, and get this uh, in our brains here, that the idea that God is a missionary God, the Bible is a missionary book, and the church is a missionary institution. If we can get that wrapped around our minds, and it's hard to do, but God is a missionary God. If He was not, why did He send His only begotten Son? A missionary book, the Bible, it's written down so that we can read it to know about our missionary God, about God sending Jesus Christ. And then a church, a church is a missionary institution. A church is the one that sent out missionaries. They're the ones that go out and reach their community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so all those three things working together. And, and the idea here is, is that if we can just get an idea of the, uh, that the Bible is this book where we read into it and find out where we can be better missionaries. Locally, globally, all around the world. There are fewer missionaries going to the field and there are more coming off the field. There are more missionaries coming off the field. Your generations, your generation missionaries are coming off the field. And my generation missionaries, there are fewer going to replace them. And we need to pray for more laborers. We need to pray for more missionaries to go to the field. Are we praying for more laborers? The Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in hell, and sadly, neither do most Christians. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in hell, and sadly, neither do most Christians. You know what, that, that should hit home with you because it hit home with me. That hit home with me. And you know what? Do I really believe that there is a hell, a literal hell? I mean, I believe there's a literal heaven, but sometimes the way I live my life, I don't believe that there's a hell by the way I live. Because I'm not giving the gospel as much as I should be. I'm not handing out the word of God as much as I should be. Do I not believe that there is a hell? As we've seen, the center of the Bible is that all nations would hear, all nations would praise God. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, it says that it's all nations and all tongues and all kindred and all people. It's everyone. Listen, when we get to heaven, it's, that is the ultimate mission field. When you get to heaven, it's not going to just be what we look like. There are going to be all nations, and all tongues, and all kindreds, and all people. The first mention of missions, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And that is the idea of Christ coming to defeat Satan. The Redeemer. To come. The very first mention of missions. And that tells me that world missions was on God's mind from the very beginning. From the very beginning, God was thinking about reaching others. So here in verse number 1 in Luke chapter 10... The Lord here appoints 70 also. These were separate from the 12 disciples. These were 70 others that He appointed, it says, to go out two and two before His face into every city and every place whither He Himself would come. And so, I don't know here, it doesn't say in Scripture, it doesn't say anywhere else in the passage, but this is my thought, so please don't mark this down as this is what I believe the Lord was saying here. 
But these are my thoughts. I think the reason the Lord sent them out two by two was for a couple reasons. Number one, maybe it was for safety's sake. Maybe it was for safety's sake. And again, I cannot necessarily prove that according to the Word of God. That's why I'm saying this is my opinion. And, you know, maybe it was for safety reasons. Maybe as they were going around giving the gospel, telling about Christ, maybe it was because of safety. But I think probably more importantly than that, the reason it was two and two was because of that iron sharpened iron. Because of that discouragement. That you have that one that comes alongside that's right there with you to encourage you. Listen, I don't know how many times that you go out on soul winning or you go knocking on doors, but it can sometimes be very discouraging. When you get someone who slams the door in your face, when you get someone who calls you a name, and you kind of just get down inside and you say, you know what, I, I, you know, forget this. I knew there's a reason why I don't do this. Or maybe you hand someone a track and they throw it back at you and they say something that's just demeaning and unkind and and you think in your mind, well, what, what reason am I doing this? This is just ridiculous. I'm not going to do this anymore. But I, I call your attention back to, do we really believe that there's a hell? Do we really believe there's a hell? Do we see the importance of getting the Word of God out? Because, see, listen, it's not about us. We're just the messengers. So when they say those things, they say them to our God. They do not say them to us. Because we are the messengers of giving out the Word of God. And so if we can remember that as we go out and people say things to us that are unkind, they're saying it to the Lord. They're not saying it to you personally. You just have to be the one that they're attacking because you're the messenger. And so I think probably here, as they went out two by two, it was for that iron sharpened and iron. It was, hey, listen, it's going to be okay. I'll tell you what, I'll get the next door, and then we'll just kind of go back and forth that way, you know, and just be there as an encouragement. To be an encouragement to that person. But he says here, before, in this verse, he says, before his face into every city and place where there himself will come. And that tells me that Christ wants the message to go out into all places, into everywhere, all places. And so here, the idea in the word every city and place, that word every is such a very is such an important word in this verse because the word every means total, whole, or entire. So you know what? You know what we have a tendency to do when we think of missionaries or when we think of maybe around where we live? We think there has to be this massive amount of people for us to go and reach. But you know what? The Bible says it's every city and place. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how big it is. There are missionaries in Brazil that are reaching millions, and I'm going to a fishing village of 6,000. But it says here in the Bible, every city and place, everywhere. Amen. You fill in the blank. The Bible needs to be everywhere. Every kindred, nation, tongue, people. Praise the Lord. And then as we come into verse number 2, this is kind of where we're going to spend a little bit more time. In verse number 2, the Bible says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And listen, I don't want to be one of these typical missionaries who comes in and preaches the missions passages. But you know, there was something in here and the Lord just really struck my heart that I had missed from years and years of reading and hearing missionaries preach on missions, uh, verses, and that kind of thing. And that's what I want to share with you a little bit tonight uh, here in verse number 2. Uh, here Jesus says, as you go out two and two into every city and every place, you 70, as you go out, you're going to find that the harvest truly is great. There are many of them out there, and there are so few of you, because the Bible says, but the laborers are few. So there are few of you as you go out, there are many of them. And so that tells me here that the Lord was saying to them, don't be discouraged. It's this, I want you to know you're the minority, but I want you to do something. I want you to pray. I want you to pray for more laborers. And you know, that was the part in my life that I missed. I wasn't praying for more laborers. I was praying for laborers, but I wasn't praying for more laborers. I wasn't doing that. I would pray for missionaries. I'd we get the missions. But I wasn't praying for more. And you know what? It's not just, again, it's not just the uttermost, but even here. 
pastor had mentioned about VBS. He said, if you're willing and able. I thought he was going to say if you're breathing. <laughs> you know, willing and able. Listen, that's your mission field. That's your mission field. That's your chance to be a missionary. That's your chance to give children the Word of God. That's your mission field. Are you going to take that opportunity and be a missionary? And I understand we're busy. We all have busy schedules. But maybe there's like one day you can help. But that can be your mission field. Find areas where you can be a missionary. Because we have to be praying for more laborers. So few do the work. We need to pray for more. Because see, when we pray, that allows the Holy Spirit, that allows God to get to work. God starts working when we start praying. Amen. It's like it just gives that more energy, and then you start seeing God answer prayer. You know, praying for someone, a child to come in, maybe out of your neighborhood, or you've been wanting to have come to church, and they finally come because you've been praying. And you have that opportunity to invite them, and they get saved. But it was because you're praying for more laborers. Pray for more laborers. Pray for more workers. Who are these laborers? That's us. Listen, pastor's not going to ask an unsaved person to work in VBS. Hey, did you teach the lessons of today? Did you do one of the lessons? He's not going to do that. Because they're not one of the laborers. The laborers are the saved. The, those in the church. We're the laborers. We're the ones that are the workers. And if we're not going to do it, who's going to do it? Who's going to give the gospel all around the world? Who's going to send missionaries if we're not? Well, if we don't, then you can start counting down who's going to start sending them, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, and, and you just go right on down the line. They're going to still send them. Well, why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we send more? Why don't we pray for more? Yeah, sure, every missionary needs to get to the field and they need that support, but they need prayer more than that. They need prayer. Prayer is so important, and that is the pivotal part of this verse in here. There are so few of us, so many of them, we need help. We need help. You need help. But why don't you pray for more helpers? Pray for more laborers. The idea of laborers is in 1 Corinthians 3.9. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. What is the church? The church isn't the building. It's the people. We are the laborers. It's our job to get the gospel out. You can't rely on a pastor to just do it himself. Well, that's pastor's job. No, if you're saved, it's your job. And if I'm saved, it's my job. And it's your job to leave tracks. And it's your job to do... To be the missionary. And so that was that was the part that I missed. I wasn't praying for more laborers. Because you know what? When you go soul winning and when you tell others about Christ, sometimes it feels like an, an isolated thing. Man, is there anybody else doing this? Is it just me? Well, let's pray for more laborers. Let's pray for more. We need to pray for more laborers. So who is it that sends missionaries? The church sends them. The, those are the laborers. They're, but they're few, and so we have to pray. And this is important as well, not just the word pray, but who are we praying to? Well, my Bible says, and I hope yours does too, my Bible says the Lord, capital L, the harvest. Hey, listen, that's not all. That's not Buddha. That's not Mary. That's not anything else you fill in there, but the Lord of the harvest. Listen, He is the Creator. He is the Creator God. It's His harvest. He created all of them. He created all of us. So He says, listen, there are a few of you, many of them. Pray to Me. I'm the one that created them. Pray to Me. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. But, if you're like me, I was praying, but I wasn't praying for more. I wasn't praying for more laborers. And sometimes we do things in our own strength. Listen, it is not easy giving the gospel because of one reason. Our selfish flesh gets in the way. How many times have you walked out of Walmart and not given a track to the lady that checked you out or the young man or the man that checked you out? You know what? Most of us, and I mean, myself included, we've started avoiding all of that and we go to the self-checkout line and there's nobody there because we want to get in and out real quick. But that's our chance to be a missionary. 
That's our chance to give the gospel. But time's more important. You see, Brother Lewis, I, I need to go and do this and then. Well, wait a minute. Let's stop and really get that. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ, not about us. Let's take the 30 seconds. You know, I'm not saying you have to go in there into Walmart and go through the gospel presentation with the lady while there's 15 people lined up calling you all kinds of sorts of names. I'm not saying that. All it takes is what? Five seconds. Just, hey, listen, you get a chance maybe on the break behind I've got some good news here for you. I know you're on your way to heaven. I appreciate it. You're so nice. Thank you. Hope to see you again. Just walk, you know, go out. It's just something real quick. And the great thing about giving the gospel, and you and I, both, all of us together, being missionaries, it doesn't take any kind of talent. You know, some things it takes talent. I grew up playing basketball. It takes some talent. It takes talent to be good. But you know what, giving the gospel... Most of us, what are we afraid of? They're going to ask me the question. Right? They're going to ask me the question. And I'm not going to know the answer to that question. But the best way that you can do, the best thing you can do with that is, hey, listen, you know what? You know, I don't really know that answer, but i tell you what. You know, we have church Sunday. And I know someone who does have that answer. i tell you what, why don't you come to church Sunday and, we'll, Sunday and we'll, we'll help you figure out what the answer is. Then. Listen, you can change it just like that. You can change it. Invite them to church. Get them. That's one way to get them in here. I mean, where are you going to be a missionary? We're all missionaries. If we're saved, if you're a born again believer, you are a missionary. It doesn't have to be the uttermost. Acts 1 8 doesn't just say the uttermost, it's locally too. Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, all. All the. That's all the area. That's Milton. That's Florida, the United States, and then the uttermost. Yes, we're going to the uttermost. But let's not forget our area. Let's not forget our area. Because we're all called to be missionaries. We're all called to pray to the Lord of the harvest for more missionaries. That He would send forth, the Bible says, more laborers in His harvest. So that tells me here that the Lord says, if you will pray to me, I'll send forth more. I mean, let's, let's think about this and reason this. If we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more missionaries, do you think God's going to say no? No, I don't want the gospel to go out. I don't want people to know about me. But, but, but. I, don't, I don't mean to be facetious or blasphemous tonight. I don't mean to, I don't, I don't want to be irreverent, but is God really going to do that? No, He's not. But you know what the problem is? If I start praying for more missionaries, God will call me, and then what am I going to do then? Right? God might call me, so why would I pray? I can't pray. God might call me. Listen, it may be where you work. That's your mission field. It may be the, the, the group that you have for uh, the, the area that you live in your, in your housing development. They have a group that gets together once. Maybe that's your mission field. Maybe it's your school, the public school that you go to. Or maybe it's someone in your youth group. But where is your mission field? And are you being a missionary reaching them? Or are you hiding the gospel as it says in 2 Corinthians? Are you hiding the gospel from them? What do we teach our children? Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. But what are we all guilty of? Hiding it under the bushel, keeping it to ourselves. Because we treat the gospel the same way after we get saved. This, we treat the same way before we got saved as we do after we got saved. We didn't want anything to do with it before, before we were saved. We didn't want anything to do with the gospel. Then we get saved. And for a little while, we want to tell others about Christ, and then it just kind of fades off, and we hide it again and want nothing to do with it. And we treat it the same way. Listen, I'm sure you were just like I was. When I got saved at 18 years old, basically, I mean, if you put it, pen it down, an atheist, didn't know what I believed. Just didn't even think there was a God. Do you know what? After I got saved, I remember two young men that were in my high school that would invite me to church and would tell me about Christ. And I can remember going up to them after I got saved and chewing them out. You say, oh, you're chewing them out? I chewed them out. I said, I could have died going to hell and you gave up on me. I mean, I lit them up. And it was wrong for me to do that, but I was, I was, I was angry. Because I could have died and gone to hell. You know what they told me? They said, Troy, you were mean, 
You wanted nothing to do with it. And we just stopped. And then I got even more upset when they said, you stop, you, we stopped. I said, yeah, why'd you stop for? Well, they stopped because I was being mean and nasty. And they just stopped. My junior year in high school, I ran cross country. I'd come back from my grandma's cabin up in Ohio that they had. Went out, ran eight, nine miles that day for practice. It was a hot summer day, we were training. I didn't have enough fluid in my body. I ended, up getting, I ended up getting into the van with my dad and driving down the schoolhouse hill, going home. And I remember sitting in there feeling, feeling kind of funny. And all of a sudden, my hands, was, my hands just kind of started curling up like this, and I couldn't move, and I, had, I started having trouble breathing. And the rest of the way, I don't remember. I remember a little bit of my dad pulling in the front yard. He didn't even use the driveway. He jumped over a ditch into the front yard, ran and called the ambulance. Ended up, I had dehydrated, went into a seizure, and uh, ended up taking me to the hospital, put an IV in and everything. You know, I always remember that. Because if something were to happen, I were to die, I would have been in hell. I would have split hell wide open. You know what? Those two young men witnessed to me before that. I wanted nothing to do with them. And I knew that in the back of my mind. And I, and I told them, I said, I can't believe you stopped. You let up. Who are you working on? Who, who are you working on with the gospel? Who are you giving the gospel? Who have you given up on? It may be that one time. Listen, hearts are hard. How many of us got saved the first time we heard the gospel? Second time, third time. It took me six months. Because I was a selfish angry, bitter person for 18 years of my life. Where's your mission field? Where's your mission field? Don't give up. Don't give up. Be patient. Love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Listen, it doesn't say that He kept His only begotten He gave. We need to be giving. We need to give. Give the Gospel. Love. Tell others about Christ. When you pump gas... They need some hope. When they look at that gas price, they need hope. Put a gospel track in the pump. Put one in there. They need some good news. Listen, we drive a Suburban. 100, $150, $160 fill up. Sometimes there needs to be some good news. <laughs> but you know what? There are people at the gas pump so we can leave a track and we will see them in heaven one day. Right now, I'm in the process of trying to make my own track. Anybody can do it. You can do it on your computer. Make your own track. I don't necessarily, I guess, recommend it if you have, if you have a bunch of them here at your church. But for us, as we travel so much, why don't you, as you leave, if there are tracks, if there's a track rack or wherever, get some tracks and pass them out. Get them and pass them out. Brag on God if you don't have any tracks. Tell Him what God's been doing in your life. And, and I, you know, I'm not promoting lifestyle evangelism. That's not what I'm saying. But where you work, people watch you. You're a walking Bible. But you could be like the guy that pulled up at a gas station one time. He was sitting there pumping his, pumping his gas, and another man pulled up on the opposite side. And uh, they happen to know each other, and they work together uh, in different departments. And he looked over at the other man and he said, hey, how are you doing? They got talking back and forth. Oh, yeah, you go to that church down here. He said, yeah, yeah, we'll be down here. Should, you should come down sometime. And the other guy says, I'll never darken the door of your church. God's kind of taken back. He said, you know, there's a guy that works in my department. He goes to that church, and he named the name. And the, the other guy goes, yeah, yeah, I know that. He says, that guy down there? He goes to your church, and he's involved in your church. That guy has the worst mouth that I've ever heard in someone, out of someone. Because see, he's living one life at where he worked, and he's living another life at church. So yes, your life does reflect what you believe, and your life does reflect how you're living for the Lord. But really, the challenge is tonight, will you pray for more laborers? Because listen, we, we all need help. We all need that help. Will you pray for more laborers? 
Secondly, consider don't give up on those you've been witnessing to. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on it. The Bible says that His Word will not return void. The verse on the back wall, so that faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Holy Spirit does the work, not us. The only work we do is to hand it out. That's all we do. We hand it out. It's something very easy. Again, it doesn't take talent. It just takes obedience. Just obedience. Do we love God enough to love others by giving them the Word of God? Will you pray for more missionaries? Will you pray for more missionaries locally, globally? And would you consider continuing to witness to that person, praying for that person or family member that you've been working on? And knowing that the Holy Spirit will continue to plow that ground and to soften their heart. And then thirdly tonight, maybe you just need to Pray and ask God, God, I need to be a better missionary. I need to be a better missionary where I live. I need to be a better missionary where I work. I need to be a better missionary where I go to school. I need to be a better missionary, you fill in the blank. Because if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are responsible to give out the Word of God, to tell others about Jesus Christ. And when you go to restaurants, you leave the gospel. And wherever you go, you're leaving literature. You're leaving the Word of God. You're leaving them in bathrooms. You're leaving them in rest areas. You're leaving them all over the place, leaving the Word of God. And then finally tonight, maybe you've heard this message, and you've heard me refer to knowing Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe tonight, you don't have that assurance. And again, I'm not preaching for you to doubt your assurance of your salvation. But the Bible says that you may know you have eternal life. And maybe you've been playing the game of church. You know those two young ladies that came forward and got saved last week, or a week and a half ago? They were playing the game of church. They were playing the game. Don't play the game. It's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Don't be flirting with heaven. No, you're saved. And if we are saved, let's give out that gospel. But tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You can know today, tonight, whether or not you'll be on your way to heaven. And so let's consider that this tonight. Do I need to be a better missionary? Do I need to pray for more laborers? Do I need to be saved? And then I need to pray that God would continue to give me the courage to continue working on people, to working on those that I gave up on so long ago. That's the right time. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word tonight. And Lord, I, I just want to thank you publicly for working in my life, saving my soul from the wickedness that I was in. And yes, I grew up in a moral family, a good family, but would have split hell wide open. Lord, I am so thankful that, that you sent two ladies I was working with and, and another lady, my wife, who was concerned about my soul. And I thank you for my salvation. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and for the whole world. And Lord, tonight, I pray that you help me personally to be a better soul winner. Help me personally to be a better missionary as wherever I go that I would pass out that literature. And Lord, would you help me to continue to work on even family members and those that I know that I've given up on. And again, Lord, I thank you for this passage. Thank you for working in my life and in my heart. Thank you for this great church. Thank you for Faith Baptist Church and the lighthouse that it is here in Milton. Thank you for the work of missions. Thank you for the mission board they have here, Home and Abroad Missions. And thank you for the emphasis that they have in reaching the lost of Jesus Christ. Pastor Peter. Thank you, brother. Let's stand to our feet, please, as this king plays. The Lord spoke to your heart. I want you to come. I want you to step out of your seat and come. Don't hesitate. Labor's praying for labor's. Labor's praying for labor's. Maybe there's some labor's here tonight. We just need to come and pray for more labor.
Let me sing, Bo Julie, if you'll sing. God spoke to your heart, won't you? The emphasis on the telling, on the presentation of the truth of the gospel. Find out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Labor is praying for more labor. People are lost and dying and going to hell. You know, the sad thing about it is that a lot of people don't even know it. Church people don't know it. Preachers, missionaries, behind pulpits, still depending on their good works rather than Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom ye also trusted, 
Now that, that I've got two English majors here, and uh, I'm sure y'all could have a field day on my English, but that doesn't mean past tense, does it? Trust me. Now I could not trust until what? Until I heard the word of truth, and what did I need to hear, Brother Andre? According to this verse, according to this verse only. The gospel, I need to know that Jesus Christ is God. Didn't I need to know that? Amen. I made a confession as a child one time, a long, long time ago. And I didn't know who Jesus I didn't know he was God. I didn't know that salvation was eternal. I thought I had to be good to keep it. So therefore, if I thought, now this is David Rowe, if I thought I had to be good to keep it, then what was I doing? I was adding to the cross, I was adding my good works to help Jesus get me there. Am I right? Amen. So that bottom line, I mean, you know, you just call it what you want. But I remember standing up before a Baptist church and telling them that I did not know that Jesus was God and I didn't know salvation was eternal. I didn't know the gift. Because the gift of God, John 4.10, is eternal life. John chapter 4, verse 14. Now, I didn't know those two things, but I said that God knew that I would learn. And I mean, I threw my chest out, Brother Lewis. I said, God knew that I would know them later, so He went ahead and saved me anyway. I don't know how many amens I got out of that passage. And I, I thought that was good. I thought, well, I'm going to set it right there, amen, and I, but this is what I believe. I was taught this way that all I needed, if I started out, go get me some assurance. Well, look here, finish up 113. In whom also after the ye believe. Now, here's where the folks are going to have a problem. When you believe, the Bible said you were sealed with that holy, after that ye believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. Amen. All right, now here it is. Here's what's going to bother a lot of people, a lot of Baptist people. What did you believe when you said you believed? Amen. It's a million dollar question. If this verse is true, you couldn't be saved until you heard the Word of God. You could not trust. That word trust, rest, and believe are synonymous. I could not trust until I heard it. I had to hear the truth. I had to hear the gospel of my son. I had to hear that Jesus was God. Jesus, God became a man, went to Calvary. God judged Christ for my very rotten, wicked sin until he was satisfied. The payment was made, death, he was put in the tomb, rose again the third day, took his blood, put it on the mercy seat, Hebrews chapter 9. I mean, I had to know these things. I did not know that at the time. So in my religious life, that verse kept haunting me. And maybe I've caused it to haunt you today. Maybe Brother Lewis, who is Especially Zach. Zach, you did a good job. <laughs> have religion that lack of truth. Amen. A lot of people got religion. A lot of Baptists got religion. Yeah, yeah. Ushers, make your way up here, Mr. Peabody. This offering goes to Brother Lewis. And you give generously to Brother Lewis. It might not be to have to pay his bills. Mercy. So. I ain't got to get him a bowl slap. <laughs> um, let us pray. Let us pray and ask God to bless us all. Amen. Brother Joe Jones, ask the Lord to multiply this offering, please. Amen. <laughs>
I said, man, you're going out in the country. You're going back where they have to pipe sunshine. All right, just pray for him as he goes over there and preaches, though. Amen. All right, as we look to the Lord in prayer, and uh, please.